American Battlefield Trust credits the 20th Maine at Little Round Top with saving Major General George Gordon Meade's Army of the Potomac, winning the Battle of Gettysburg, and setting the South on a long, irreversible path to defeat. That's some huge accolades for the action of one unit during a single battle, and it isn't even true. We can n never discount the heroic actions of Colonel Chamberlain and his men. He indisputably blunted the effects of the relentless attacks of the 15th and 47th Alabama, and for at least the time being saved the Union left. But to say they were responsible for winning the Battle of Gettysburg not only discounts the heroic actions of many other units, but is also historically inaccurate. And here's why. The 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry was a three-year regiment that fought with the Army of the Potomac. It served between autumn 1862 and spring of 1865, fighting at Shepherdstown Ford, Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, the Overland Campaign, Peebles Farm, Hatcher's Run, and Five Forks. Altogether, 1,621 men served in the regiment, of whom 293 died. The regiment was created in the summer of 1862, put together from volunteers recruited across several counties in central and southern Maine. The unit was just another generic infantry unit with no flashy moniker, no folk tales behind the history, and no heroic figures within their ranks. They were as blue-collar as they come. The unit did have some history before the famous day in July. The regiment lost four men killed and 32 wounded, charging deadly Marie's Heights late in the day on the 13th, and spent the next day and two nights lying in the open in front of the Confederate positions. After the battle, serving as a rear guard, the 20th Maine was one of the last regiments back across the Rappahannock. Looking for redemption, the unit headed north towards infamy. Perhaps the most famous legend for the 20th Maine prior to the battle attests to the leadership ability of their commander, Colonel Richard Chamberlain. The regiment initially fielded a total complement of 1,621 men, but by the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, the stress of campaigning had reduced the regiment's ranks to some 266 soldiers, and the 20th was considered a weak link in Vincent's brigade. Fortune, however, was to smile on Chamberlain's regiment in the form of unexpected reinforcements. On May 23, 1863, 120 three-year enlistees from the 2nd Maine Infantry were marched under guard into the regimental area of the 20th Maine. The 2nd Maine men were in a state of mutiny and refused to fight, angered because the bulk of the regiment had been discharged and sent home, and the regiment had been disbanded. The mutineers claimed they had only enlisted to fight under the second main flag, and if their flag went home, so should they. Chamberlain had orders to shoot the mutineers if they refused duty. Fortunately for the men of the second main, Chamberlain was born and grew up in Brewer, the twin city of Bangor across the Penascopic River, where the second main regiment was recruited. Chamberlain wisely distributed the second main volunteers evenly to fill out the twentieth main's ranks and integrated experienced soldiers among the untested twentieth main. On Little Round Top, the 120 experienced combat veterans from the 2nd Maine brought the 20th ranks up to 386 infantry and helped hold Chamberlain's wobbling line together. The 386 men of the 20th Maine were placed at the Union far left by Colonel Strong Vincent between 4 and 4.30 p.m. and given the order to hold their position at all costs. This position was a large diabase spur of Big Round Top with an oval crest that forms a short ridge line with a summit of 63 feet. The site, approximately two miles south of Gettysburg, was a, with a rugged, steep slope rising 150 feet above nearby Plum Run to the west was strewn with large boulders scattered throughout the terrain. At the time of the battle, the western slope was generally free of vegetation, while the summit and eastern portion and southern slopes were slightly wooded. Robert E. Lee's flank attack plan in the southern part of Gettysburg battlefield called for the division of Lt. Gen. James Longstreet's corps to attack obliquely from the southwest along Emmitsburg Road and roll up the Federal line. 
Longstreet, who had advocated maneuvering completely around the Union left before attacking, did not believe in the attack, but followed his orders to the letter, despite repeated objections from his subordinates. His men were tired when they reached the jumping-off point for the attack, having had to march, sometimes countermarch, for several hours. They were surprised to find Federals in front of them at the beginning of the assault where none had been reported. Major General Dan Sickles had moved his Third Corps about three-quarters a mile in advance of the Union line to take up a position in a wheat field, a peach orchard, and around a tumbled mass of huge boulders known as Devil's Den. Hood's division at the right end of Longstreet's Corps began the attack around 4 p.m., Brigadier General Evander Law, whose brigade formed the far right of Hood's division, disobeyed orders and attacked straight ahead instead of on the oblique to avoid being inf inflated by fire from Devil's Den. While most of Law's men engaged Federals around Devil's Den, he sent two regiments under Colonel William Oates, looping right to chase some members of the 2nd U.S. sharpshooters off Round Top. Oates succeeded, though not without sustaining casualties from the sharpshooter's accurate fire. Maneuvering around boulders and through thick underbrush, his men finally reached the summit, and Oates could see the entire Federal line. He could also see, about a half mile away, the summit of Little Round Top, which was about a hundred feet lower than where he stood. Unlike the heavily wooded Big Round Top, much of the trees on Little Round Top had been cut down months earlier. He could plainly see that only a handful of men from the Union Signal Corps were on the hill. Receiving orders to take Little Round Top, Oates and his tired men worked their way down to the valley between the two hills, where they were joined by a regiment of their fellow Alabamians and two from Texas. The newcomers had fought their way through the fringe of Devil's Den, where heavy fighting continued. The five regiments began ascending Little Round Top with 4th Texas on the left, and then 5th Texas, 4th Alabama, 47th Alabama, and on the right flank, the 15th Alabama. Two-thirds of the way to the summit, they were met with volleys of rifle and cannon fire. The 20th Maine was now fully engaged. Vincent's men took up a position down slope on the far side of the crest along a ledge. From left to right, the regiments were the 20th Maine, 83rd Pennsylvania, 44th New York, and 16th Michigan. They were supported on their right by 10 Parrot rifles from 1st Lieutenant Charles Hazlitt's battery. The fe Federals got into position just 15 minutes before the Alabama and Texas troops arrived. The Confederates, rocked by the initial volley, responded with their own fire. A bullet struck Colonel Vincent fatally. Reportedly, his last words were, Don't give an inch. The 140th New York Regiment from Brigadier General Stephen Weed's brigade arrived, sent by Warren to reinforce the Union position. Its commander, Colonel Patrick O'Rourke, was killed almost instantly. Soon, Weed's other three regiments, the 146th New York, 91st and 155th Pennsylvania, joined the defenders on Little Round Top. Weed himself, standing near one of Hazlitt's gun, was killed by a shot to the head, reportedly from a Confederate sharpshooter in Devil's Den below. Lieutenant Hazlitt, too, fell dead, also reportedly for the victim of a Devil's Den sharpshooter. The Federals had rapidly deployed some 3,000 infantry and Hazlitt's gunners to oppose five Southern regiments that had totaled around 2,400 when the day began. The two sides kept up a galling fire and made repeated charges and countercharges. Perhaps the most critical point of the Union line was the extreme left, held by the less than 360 men of the 20th Maine under Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, a former minister and professor. If they gave way, the Federals would be outflanked. Opposing them were nearly 650 Confederates of the 47th and 15th Alabama. When his men ran low on ammunition, Chamberlain ordered a bayonet charge. Whether he conceived the idea himself or it came from First Lieutenant Holloman S. Welcher, the charge successfully broke up a flanking attempt by the 15th Alabama and drove them back, whereupon Company B of the 20th Maine and members of the 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters, concealed behind a stone wall, opened fire, finishing the Alabamians' attack for the day. 
Fighting on the far side of the line had been equally intense. The Texans had nearly broken through the 16th Michigan, but the timely arrival of the 140th New York saved the Union right on the hill. Around 6.30 p.m., Oates ordered all regiments to withdraw. The 15th Alabama had lost nearly half of its 520 men. The Texans lost all officers except for Major J.C. Rogers. Officer casualties were heavy on both sides and included Colonel Oates's brother, Lieutenant John Oates, killed while attacking the 20th Maine. The fight for Little Round Top was over. But farther north, along the Emmitsburg Road, brutal battles were being fought in the wheat field and peach orchard. Thinking logically from the point of view of the Confederates, the attack seemed reckless, almost suicidal. Exhausted soldiers attacking a fixed position uphill with little cover was a recipe for disaster, but thanks to a book labeled as historical fiction, by the way, these events have taken on a life of their own. Again, in no way do I wish to discount the heroic efforts of the 20th Maine and the other defenders of Little Round Top, but at some point the facts must take hold. Fact 1. The Texans and Alabamians attacking the Federal positions were exhausted. They had marched all day, fought at Devil's Den, and attacked uphill at least four times in the hot sun. It is necessary to ask what Oates was going to do with Little Round Top had he managed to capture it. There were no other troops prepared to reinforce him, as the rest of the First Corps was engaged in brutal fighting, and Major General George Pickett's division, Longstreet's lone remaining force, had not yet arrived on the battlefield. Additionally, the entire Union Six Corps had reached the battlefield directly to the east of Little Round Top in the mid-afternoon, and certainly could have been utilized to retake Little Round Top if necessary, as could have elements of Brigadier General James Barnes' division and Brigadier General Roman Iyer's division of the Union Fifth Corps. In later years, Oates described his efforts to capture both of the Round Tops as an objective that should have been pursued. Oates states, within half an hour I could convert Big Round Top into a Gibraltar that I could hold against ten times the number of men that I had. In analyzing Oates' claim, author Henry Fans writes, The battle was raging below. The division was attacking, not defending. His regiments were needed on the firing line, not in a defensive position on Round Top, that had no value in the situation at hand. Franz Rape further states, Round Top had little or no value as an artillery position in attack that afternoon. Additionally, it remains a mystery where Oates would have found any stray batteries to fortify Big Round Top, for none were in the vicinity. Even if a battery had been located, Fons continues, one can easily assume that the fight for that day would have been over before any guns could have been dragged to the top of the hill. If Oates had managed the Herculean task of placing a battery on Big Round Top, Fons concludes, they still could not have been used unless trees were felled to clear a field of fire. One can then wonder what targets would have been fired at that could not have been assailed equally effectively from guns in other positions. Fact 2. Units were stacked up northeast of Chamberlain's position, and there is some evidence that there was, were units dispatched to help the 20th Maine, and that Chamberlain was aware of this. Again, without discounting what these brave warriors did on that late afternoon, it is obvious that their effort was not the singular action that won the battle for the Union. The following evidence is a little more controversial, but is rooted in fact. We know that the Sixth Corps had arrived and was tired, but ready for action. The divisions were commanded by Generals Horatio G. Wright, Brigadier General Albion B. Howe, and Major General John Newton. The Sixth had marched upwards of 37 miles in about 17 hours to reach Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 2, 1863. The First Division deployed and saw action at Little Round Top in the wheat field. Despite being the largest corps in the Union Army at the time, the rest of Sixth Corps was mostly held in reserve to the east of Gettysburg. However, all this was happening far away from the action, and Colonel Chamberlain would have no idea that these troops were available, right? Probably not. He was involved in the fight for his life, low on ammunition and running out of options, right? So why did he make this statement in his after-action report? 
Colonel Rice informed me of the fall of Colonel Vincent, which had devolved the command of the brigade on him, and that Colonel Fisher had come up with a brigade to our support. These troops were massed in our rear. It was the understanding, as Colonel Rice informed me, that Colonel Fisher's brigade was to advance and seize the western slope of Round Top, where the enemy had shortly before been driven. But after considerable delay, this intention, for some reason, was not carried into execution. We were apprehensive that if the enemy were allowed to strengthen himself in that position, he would have a great advantage in renewing the attack on us at daylight or before. So it appears Chamberlain didn't know there were troops being held in reserve. He knew that they were supposed to be sent forward to fill in the gaps. Did he call for them to come up? Did they... Could they, at the very best, provide them with desperately needed ammunition? Or was he talking about the two Pennsylvania units, the 155th and the 91st, and the 146th New York, that had already been used to fill the gaps in the center and right? If this was the case, why would the right be reinforced over the more important left? Or was he referring to the arrival of the Sixth Corps? Civil War historians know the timing of battles and other events is suspect at best. Soldiers and generals could not glance at their cell phone to see what the correct time was. Most times were estimates at best. Post-battle assessments and after-action reports were often written days after the battle, well after the fog of war had worn off and personal recall takes over. Such is the case in this engagement. I have read several different accounts, both Rebel and Union, and the times are certainly not precise and vary greatly. Some list the rebel attack as starting at 4, some list it as 4.30, some show the arrival of the 20th Maine as 5, and some list it as early as 3. S same with the arrival of the 6th Corps. Some references show the arrival as early as 3 p.m., while others have them in place around 5. In fact, the entire July 2nd timeline of the 6th Corps is foggy. As indicated by Major General Sedgwick's after-action report, the VI Corps were dispersed along the ridge. Sedgwick writes, Wheaton's and Eustace's brigades of the 3rd Division, temporarily commanded by Brigadier General Wheaton and Bartlett's brigade of Wright's Division, went into action about 5 p.m. on the left center between divisions of the V Corps and assisting and repulsing the assault of the enemy. Russell's and Tolbert's brigades of Wright's division were held in reserve that night. Neal's brigade of Howe's division was sent to the right of the line, reporting to Major General Slocum, and Grant's brigade of the same division was posted on the extreme left of the general line. Scheller's brigade of Wheaton's division was held in reserve near the left center. Colonel Rice, filling in for the mortally wounded Strong Vincent, would indicate in his after-action report Having, with the aid of this officer, properly disposed of three regiments of this force, I ordered Colonel Chamberlain of the 20th Maine to advance and take position of the mountain. This order was promptly and gallantly executed by this brave and accomplished officer. Colonel Fisher at once ordered two regiments of his command to support Colonel Chamberlain, and the hill remained permanently in our possession. Colonel Garrard, commander of the 146th New York, would write, the other regiments, the 146th New York Volunteers and the 91st and 151st Pennsylvania Volunteers, were led to the right and front some distance and formed in a line in a narrow valley to support a portion of 3rd Corps and Watson's battery, then severely pressed by the enemy before becoming engaged. However, orders were received for these re regiments to return at double quick to Round Top Ridge and secure and hold that position. The 91st was posted on the left of the battery connecting with the 140th. The 146th and 155th were posted on the right, extending from the battery on the summit along the crest of the ridge to the gorge on the right. There is other correspondence from commanders in the Sixth Corps, complaining and chomping at the bit to get into action. So, is this definitive proof that Colonel Chamberlain was a fraud? Certainly not, and I certainly hope no one feels that way. But it does call into question the contention that the 20th Maine was the bastion of the Union left. Had Oates and his men broken through, they certainly would have met with the remaining units of the Sixth Corps. The exhausted Alabamians and Texans would have been fodder for the waiting boys in blue. 
The actions of those that fought on that hill that day had a huge impact on the outcome of the battle, but I do feel calling it the action that won the war is, at best, inaccurate. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. Love it.